I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and I would like to welcome you to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. It is a pleasure to have you here, and it is a pleasure to continue our programming here in the center. Um, we opened in 2007, in March of 2007, and in addition to being an exhibition space and clearly the home of the wonderful dinner party by Judy Chicago, we are also dedicated to not only feminist art, past, present, and future, but to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions, to educate new generations uh, about the meaning of feminist art, and to maintain a very dynamic and welcoming uh, facility to present panel discussions and um, enjoy uh, guests who come to lecture uh, for us, such as Sonia Osorio today. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Sonia Osorio and to introduce her to you. She is president of the National Organization for Women, and she has titled her presentation today, A, a Global Epidemic, Human Trafficking in Your Neighborhood. And Sonia just said to me, she's here, she's uh, here to speak about that and all kinds of other things that might um, come up for all of you any questions you have for her and any direction she would like to take us in, I think it would be very, will be very exciting. Sonia um, was a former journalist. She has written extensively on women entrepreneurs and women in corporate America. Her work has appeared in USA Today, the Denver Post, the Journal News, and the San Jose Mercury News, among others. Ms. Osoria has spoken widely on the subject of women in the workplace, including the keynote address at the 2000 Conference of the National Association for the Empowerment of Hispanic Women. Uh, Sonia Osorio was elected president of NOW NYC, which is the charter chapter of the National Organization of Women in January 2005. As president of NOW NYC, uh, Ms. Osorio has led a campaign to repeal the statute of limitations on rape. And for this, uh, we all must be extremely grateful. Uh, she waged and continues to wage a large public education and media campaign uh, were key components in, harding, in, in fighting uh, this victory uh, for women. And she has crisscrossed the state meeting with legislators, local attorneys, and sexual assault service providers. She garnered support by talking about the devastating effects this outdated law has had on women, family, and society in general. In June of 2006, again led by Sonia, now NYC uh, launched its new campaign, its latest campaign, Ending the Business of Human Trafficking in New York City again raising awareness uh, in communities of human trafficking throughout New York State. She advocated on behalf of victims by lobbying legislation, tra tra tracking traffickers, and educating local businesses about their role in the illegal uh, industry in helping to break the cycle of this uh, severe problem. Of course, there is still much work to be done, but thanks to Sonia's commitment, and tenacity, New York State Legislature passed an anti-trafficking law in the 2007 legislative session, for which I thank you, and I'm happy to introduce you. Please join me in welcoming Sonia Osario from NOW and Wesley. Well, I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming here. It's a gorgeous Sunday afternoon. This is uh, the subject we'll start with is, is not one that's um, you know, light on the heart, um, but I want to be very open and frank with you about it when I talk to you about uh, what I have seen and, and learned from victims and what I've seen in our communities. And it should be very eye-opening for you. And I know we have quite a bit of time, so um, I'm going to take my cues from you guys. Give me faces, give me hand signals. Um, if you have a question to ask at any point, um, and maybe what we'll do is I'll talk for a little while, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, have some, some discussion, and then we can go on to maybe uh, another area in this. And we can also talk about whatever you'd like. Um, I would love to, before I leave, to just get your thoughts about what you feel are the really critical issues facing women 
uh, in our country and, and particularly here in our city moving forward. And I know the economy is certainly a big issue and it's, it's something that I'd like, I'd love to learn from you as to what um, I can take back to, uh, to my organization, the things that we might think about for the future. So in terms of tra trafficking, there are a, a few to topics that we could talk about that I'd love to tell you a little bit about. Basically, you know, trafficking today, what does it look like? A little bit of the bigger picture, uh, then a little bit about, you know, in our neighborhoods. It's an international problem that many of us think of it as an international problem, but what that means is you have to bring it back home, and that means it's happening in our community and in communities across the globe. Um, I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about the community activism that we've been a part of that you could uh, take back to your neighborhoods if you like. The other thing that I think uh, will be interesting to talk about is a little bit about the, the cultural, the climate that we live in, in terms of the culture that, um, that lends itself to, to allowing an industry like trafficking to, to flourish. Um, and then I think that you, know, you can't talk about issues of trafficking and, and you know, prostitution that is coerced and such without talking about demand. And it's something that we just don't talk enough about. Because without the demand, we wouldn't have. The market is there because of it. So, um, so there's all interesting things in this area. So in terms of trafficking today, many of you probably know, one of the reasons you were probably attracted to come to, to hear more about this and learn more about it is that this is an issue. Um, in terms of uh, the United States, the first law was passed in the year 2000, a federal law called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was a first recognition that this was happening here in this country. Um, and it gave the Department of Justice the, um, the tools to try and go after traffickers. Can you guys hear me? Fine? Okay. Um, and the Department of Justice has done a pretty good job. I mean, they have really, some of the cases that they have cracked open are um, jaw-dropping. Uh, there are still people today who feel that not enough is being done. Um, and, you know, that's probably par for the course. Uh, it's, it's, it's really tough because trafficking isn't, doesn't resemble like the robbery on the street that's easy for all of us to recognize and see and understand, you know, who and how you're a victim. Trafficking is much more insidious. So I'll give you an example of, uh, of some things. I'll just give you actually real life examples of some of the things here in New York City. One of the, what was the biggest case uh, up until recently was a federal case that was um, in um, that, this trafficking ring that operated between Tenancingo, Mexico and uh, Queens. And they operated for at least 13 years. That's what they were tracked for. And, uh, it was a particularly brutal operation, um, and what they would do is they would go to the rural parts of, of Mexico and find women. They were uneducated, you know, un unworldly, tell them that they had jobs for them here in the United States, which, you know, seems like a very innocent and obvious thing. And, you know, once they were in their grips, they basically seasoned them, is a word that's used in the industry, by raping them and beating them. You know, often they'll use one person there, you know, a, a beating, a killing, to, to put people in their place. And if you can just imagine yourself in that position for a minute, you would be very obedient, because you'd, you, you'd want to save your own life. So they would bring the women uh, to Queens, and um, you know, they, were, they were locked up, and they were forced to work seven days a week. I mean, I mean some of the, the actual brutality of the amount of work that they're subjected to, I use the word, the word work loosely, um, is it, startling and hard to comprehend it. It takes a while, it takes a while. It's almost hard to believe at first until you know story after story that you actually, you hear that, that you know, the, the human body and mind can, can, can handle it. Um, these women had forced abortions. Um, it, was, it was 20, at that time, it's been two years now, and um, the three main players have gotten sentences of 50 years in prison and 25 years for two of them. Um, and uh, so that was, a, that, was a, that was a great victory and that ring was broken up. Um, those women, it's harder to find out exactly what's happened to those women. Here, 
what, the way it's set up is that if you, um, if you cooperate with authorities, if you're willing to testify against your trafficker, there are some things that can be done. You can get a certain visa that will give you some time to work here. You can get some, some, some benefits. But, um, but nobody, whether they're um, young American girls who are trafficked or, or foreign women who are trafficked here, what's available for them is, is there's not a lot. There is not a lot. And that's one of the things that we'd like to do in the future is to, um, to get some funds for that, which of course in this economic climate is very, very tough, but to maybe expand some of the, the current types of domestic violence shelters to be able to accommodate uh, women who have been trafficked. Um, so, so that's just one of the, the cases. There was um, another case just last year which involved as Korean women. I think predominantly into the, into the New York City area, what you find mostly is South American and from there mostly Mexican, some Central American women that are trafficked. You see big operations from Korea in China. Uh, not so much now from the former Soviet Union. That was maybe the period before uh, more in the, the, the early 90s when there was such economic upheaval there. That's all you have to do is look around the world and see where there's real turmoil and that's where the vulnerability is going to exist and that is where these, these you know, human trafficking entrepreneurs will, will go and find their supply. So the Korean women in, uh, that was in Flushing, in Flushing, they, um, there was a house that they, they had and they had a secret compartment that, would, that led to another house where the women slept and um, you know, there were 69 women that they rescued. None of them spoke English at all. In the vault, what did they find? Which is very common, they found their passports because that's one of the first things you do is you take somebody's passport. Um, they found $800,000 in cash. It's a lot of money and that's a lot of, that's a lot of you know, low budget sex acts that had to be performed for that. If you, if you, you, know, you want to break it down that way, it's, it's, that's what it is. Um, and the supply, a supply of ecstasy drugs. I mean, it was like, that's like a trafficker's little toolkit there. Um, of course, with the, um, with the ecstasy, I mean, you know, it's the best way to, to keep someone as well somewhat obedient. I read a very, very good book recently that I really recommend to all of you. Um, it's not based on American trafficking, but it's based uh, on trafficking in Cambodia, which is, you know, you just, it, it, it puts it into perspective. It is certainly terrible what's happening here, but in Cambodia, it's the, the public has no problem with it. The police, you know, from, from the low level to the high level, law enforcement uh, are completely cooperative with traffickers, and it's very young girls, four years old starting up, who are, uh, you know, forced into prostitution, sold into prostitution, um, and it's a way of life. But the book is called The Road of Lost Innocence, and it's by a woman named Somali Man, M-A-M. And uh, she's an, an, an amazing woman, incredibly inspirational. She was sold into prostitution when she was 16, and uh, you know, managed to get out and build a life for herself and find a sense of self-worth which is what's completely lost for women who are trapped in this. And, um, and then she started to, uh, you know, she started her life by going back around and you know, distributing condoms, by going into the brothels and just saying, oh, I work as a nurse at the hospital. You know, give me your sickest. I'll, I'll take her, we'll fix her up, we'll bring her back. Um, and she has a, an amazing shelter and she's raised, you know, just, international awareness of the situation in Cambodia. So it's a really, really good book and uh, it's worth reading. It gives you a little global perspective on the issue of human trafficking. Um, so I recommend it highly. Somali Man, S-O-M-A-L-Y, and her last name is M-A-M. So the Korean women um, were, were rescued. Uh, many of them were, were sent back to their, their their countries, um, and those uh, traffickers are in the process of being prosecuted. And it's, it's you know, there's all the players in it are from the, the person who's the, the, the recruiter, they can extradite from that country, to the, the, the brothel owners here who accept these women into their networks from the traffickers, 
the drivers, many, many, you know, those are the, the smaller players, but, but they're a big part of it because, you know, if you're going to pretty much keep women um, isolated, you need to pull up in a van, you know, throw them in the van, and, you know, take them to the next county to another brothel. Um, so, so these, these, uh, these drivers, these transporters um, play a big part, and they're prosecuting them as well. Um, there was another case of um, a woman that I spent a great deal of time with, and who she actually helped us uh, with our campaign last year to pass the first trafficking law here in New York City, uh, in New York State. And um, she is from Venezuela, and uh, she again was told by you know the cousin of an of an of an of a friend, you know, that there were great jobs here. Someone met her at the airport, and the first night she was here, she was in a, a brothel and had 19 customers. Really difficult to understand. And that's, what's ha that's what is the landscape here in the cities that we live in. It's not just Manhattan, it's not just Queens, it's not just Brooklyn. It's Westchester as well, and Rockland County, it's the sub sur suburbs. and. Um, the, the, the rate at the time when she started, when the, when the Mexican women, uh, that case rounded up, it was $25 per sex act for 15 minutes with a timer by your side. It's just like assembly style, um, you know, prostitution. And um, now it's up to 35. That's, that's the going rate for the 15 minutes. Um, so she has been able to stay and she has two daughters here and she has a job and uh, she is really one of the lucky ones and she was able to to um, get a lot of support from Sanctuary for Families which is a, a domestic violence shelter uh, and legal services for battered women that has been able to cobble together some additional funds to to direct to victims of trafficking so we're hoping in the future that they'll be able to um, do more of that. Um, and then there was another case that just uh, in December was, um, was indicted and this ring dealt as well in Korean and Chinese women and they had an, a network of brothels. So they would, take the, they would take the women on a circuit. It was like a tour. So they would bring them into JFK, they'd do some different brothels here and there, then they would be on to, it was the network operated from Washington, D.C. to Rhode Island. So they're on the road all the time. So, for you, so you can imagine, for the women, they never, they never acclimated to any area. They never got used to a neighborhood and how they might escape or get to know anybody. They were constantly on the road. And um, so that was a very big and significant trafficking ring that was, um, that was uncovered. But it takes a lot of money and a lot of time to, to do this. Because as I started out, it doesn't resemble the, the, the robbery on the street that we all can recognize. It, it's, it means that we need our prosecutors and our law enforcement uh, to be able to do wiretaps, to have the resources to go undercover, to, um, you know, all the things that they do in regular types of investigations that build a case. You do that a lot with organized crime. Um, so while our federal government started this in 2000 with the, with the passing of this law, and there's been a lot of great things that have come from it, and they're learning every day what better ways to prosecute these cases, and learning that more sensitivity needs to be needs to be there for the victims and how to help them. I mean, there is some criticisms, like you have to take part in a prosecution to get any help. You know, you're, 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 you're scared to death. These people have kept you hostage, have maybe killed the girl next to you. They just want to get away. They don't want to be part of it. So that, there's some work there still to be done. Um, and the law that we passed here for New York State in 2007 was similar in the sense that it created the crime of trafficking. There really was nothing on the books before that. There's rape and there's kidnapping um, and there's promoting prostitution, which is a very, very minor offense. But there's nothing that says, you know, if you deliberately 
are a business person, your business is to dupe and trick and intimidate um, people to make, so that you can make money off of them, there was no law, there was no crime of human trafficking. And to prove rape and to prove ki kidnapping in that moment is often difficult. And sometimes it doesn't rise to that occasion. Let me tell you about this one young Russian woman who answered an ad in her newspaper for an employment uh, agency. Great, she was coming to the US to get a job. She flew first to Chicago. Someone met her there. This is how this, the ring was work. And then they put her on a bus here to Brooklyn. And um, you know, she's, the next thing, she's in Coney, Coney Island. And they told her she's you know, sleeping on somebody's couch. And they said, well, oh, that job for the nanny is gone. Uh, well, the job for the waitress you need papers for. So it's this, it's this thing. She's in a foreign country. She doesn't know anybody. Uh, you know, each day, each day she's a little bit more backed into the corner. So they tell her, well, you can work in a massage parlor. She says, well, I don't even know how to do massage. You'll learn it. It's not a big deal. So you know where this story goes. Before you know it, she is, she's, she's having to work in prostitution in a massage parlor. The only reason that she was discovered is because when she got the opportunity to take enough pills, she swallowed them all. And she ended up in Coney Island Hospital. Uh, and her situation is, I mean, you wouldn't be able to prove rape or uh, you could prove some fraud, which is one of the things in the New York State law that we got passed, which was very, very difficult to do. Because they just wanted the force and the coercion. Um, you know, so, uh, so for her, you know, she ended up in this hospital and that's the other area that we have to, it's not just law enforcement on the ground that needs to be able to recognize what trafficking looks like, but it's, it's also the healthcare workers. Because most victims are not gonna run to the police first because they come from countries, Russia, Mexico, where you know, the reputation the police are corrupt. That's not where you turn to for help. And in many cases, you know, the police work with the organized crime syndicates. There wasn't, you know, you opened the New York Times not that long ago to see a picture of a, of a young officer, and he was being, he was being uh, indicted because what he was doing with two brothels in, in, um, in Flushings is he was protecting one getting kickbacks from one by arresting and, and raiding the other brothel to increase the other one's business. And this is where trafficked women were being held. So it's, um, you know, here this is, you know, it's hard to believe, I mean, that this is our, it's not even that different from some of these stories that you hear from other countries. And somehow you kind of start out thinking, well, no, not, not in the great city of New York City, not in, not in the United States. But, you know, in this market, you know, when the lights go down at night, it doesn't look any different. It's not any less vicious, brutal, chaotic, corrupt. So that's just some of the reality. And um, some of the things that, uh, you want me to stop right now, see if you have any questions about this part. I mean, what I'm just trying to go over initially is, the United States, in terms of legally what's happening with trafficking, we passed the 2007 law, which I can tell you more about if you like. Uh, a little, some of the, the impediments to you know, facilitating that law, uh, some of the cases that we've seen. You had a question in the back? Is there any statistics on the numbers? Or? You know, it doesn't exist because it's just not something that we we really follow. I mean, it's all very new. Even though it was 2000 when this law was passed, it took a couple, it, you know, uh, nationally, it took a couple years to get things going. It's all relatively new. The estimations from the State Department to uh, other, other um, agencies can vary. Some are that there are at least 17,000 trafficking victims in the United States at any given time. Um, you know, it's impossible to come up with a number locally because we just don't investigate it enough. It's, we very much operate, we have a culture of, of prostitution, so it's not, 
you know, brothels operate here and there everywhere. And it's not something that we're that concerned with. And that's very important. It's a lot, a lot of what we do, you know, at now. My, my job is to, to kind of... Shelter to, Silver, for example, or... Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Sheldon Silver, uh, although he gives you a hard time the whole way through, I mean, the two laws that we, that we have passed did not happen without you know, without him green lighting it and him him getting behind it, and that was the the repeal of the statute of limitations on rape, and um, as well the, the trafficking law in 2007. So, um, so at the end of the day, I have to say that he's been he's been very good on making sure that these issues um, do come to the forefront. It's a little alarming the degree of power that one person can have. These these uh, you know rep respective leaders of the houses because it's not such a democracy when you start to, when you're in the thick of it and you see how, you know, you can have, you know, both houses overwhelmingly pass a measure and you can have a few people in a room decide that it never gets to the floor or that it just dies on the floor or that, um, you know, this in the 2008 legislate, legislative session, we worked on another uh, law called the Safe Harbor Act. And with that, it passed at the very last minute but even though there was overwhelming support in both houses and they came to agreement on it, you know, which is what they do, they come into session and they iron out the, the, the fine points of each, each version of the bill to come, with, to come together with one bill. Um, it could have, they, they could have just decided to never send it to the governor's office for signing and it would have died. So it's very, very interesting to see how all this process works. Um, Frank Padavan, who is here in, he's in Queens, is actually a sponsor of the, um, the trafficking legislation from 07. Uh, he's a Republican. Um, actually, I don't even, we just had, well, there, he's having an election in November. I don't, rem I don't remember who his, his competitor is. Um, Jeffrey Klein in the Bronx has been really fabulous. He worked very, very hard on the statute of limitations on rape. And I think one of the things that you can do to evaluate your representatives, it's very easy. I mean, you know, you get their newsletters and they say, I've co-sponsored this, I've co-sponsored that. It's all you have to do to co-sponsor something is put your name. You just, a two second call, oh yeah, sign me up for that. There's a world of difference between that and being listed on a, on, on a hundred different pieces of legislation and being the originator of something, um, which is a ton of work, meaning you know you have to meet with me and you have to meet with the, you know the Sanctuary for Families and all the different advocates to get their perspective on what's happening on the ground. You have to you have to have your 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 counsel and your legal staff research precedent across the country and put things together. And then the bigger part is going out and really selling it. You've got to get your colleagues' endorsement, and you've got to do a lot of public education. I mean, uh, Jeff Klein with the uh, with the statute of limitations on rape, I found it to be incredibly admirable because he had initially introduced it a couple of times as um, you know as a Democrat in the Senate, which he didn't have very much power. So he actually got somebody else to introduce it using all of his research and facts and all the things that you do to build a case for something and somebody else introduced it but he was still out, the, out there you know on Sunday afternoon we were in front of you know City Hall having press conferences and he was at the public forums at night speaking on behalf of this um, so it's it's a lot of time and effort and uh, that's really where the test of what they're doing for us is so I, hopefully that's helpful for you yes is this a form of slavery? it is It, it, in the federal legislation, it, it is. It certainly is called slavery. Um, there, there is some discussion about whether the 
the description of what that slavery is is broad enough? Uh, you know, and I was mentioning before, you know, is fraud part of that? I mean, with the Russian woman that I described to you, she was defrauded. I mean, she, an employment agency said she was, there was a job for her, she came here, and there wasn't a job, she had absolutely no options, there were scary people around her, and the place she ends up is in is a massage parlor. Some people would say, hmm, that moment, did she have an opportunity to run? Did she have to go to that massage parlor? Where is the force or the coercion? And I think that you know what we've done, what we were able to do in the state, legis in the state legislation is to make the case that you know, it's not that black and white. And if we don't include that type of, of fraud and really define what coercion is, we're going to lose a lot of people. Because you know, it's, there's lots of ways that this happens. You can grab someone by the hair, throw them in the, in the trunk of a car, and put them in a brothel. That's very clear cut. But the, but the description with the Russian woman who, who came here. And then you know, there's another woman who, and this is very popular in the Russian organized trafficking uh, area, where they'll threaten your family. So then you say, well, is that real force? But someone is telling you, you, you know they're bad guys, you know they're criminals, and they're like, you know, you can do this for the next six months. You can just suck it up, make us the money that we intended to make on you, and get back to your family, or we can take your kids' organs. And you, know, you take them serious. <laughs> and um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the reality of what can happen. Yes. Well, unfortunately, you know, the environment now is that a lot of that, that federal grant money has dried up. The, um, the NYPD did, did get some grant money. The City of New York Criminal Justice Coordinator's Office did get some money, and they've started a task force, and I can talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, and they're trying to incorporate the traffic, you know, we even starting with just trying to identify the trafficking victims and certify them as that, that whole process of how you do that had to be done first before saying, okay, and now they're eligible for money. So the, um, the 2007 bill did have a f some funded mandate, uh, but not a great deal. Um, the, the Division of Criminal Justice Services, the uh, OTADA is the acronym for this organization, has done a good job of facilitating that certification you know, you can get some emergency funds within, you know, 24 hours if a law enforcement or other agency contacts and we have this victim. The problem is it's, it's capped very, it's very low. So it doesn't go far is one of the problems. Um, and so the other part of your question, I'm not sure if I answered it all. Um, the law enforcement piece, we could start talking about that a little bit uh, since, since you brought that up. Um, so we've talked about these are the laws that exist, how they're coming along in terms of implementation, and we touched on the, the, the idea of how law enforcement has to be more, more uh, aware and trained and has to be a priority and how, you know, for, it, you know, there could be a lot done in churches, a lot of women, you know, seek refuge in churches and in the healthcare arena, from the emergency rooms to the many, many community, uh, um, low-cost clinics that exist here, particularly in Queens and Brooklyn. Um, so in terms of law enforcement, there was a $450,000 grant that the NYPD got uh, in 2005. The truth of the matter is it took them a year and a half to even move on trying to get the money in. This has not been a priority at all for the NYPD. They did get the money. They use it a lot for overtime for a, a, small, a small group that's doing trafficking work. And um, a lot of what they're focusing on now is child prostitution. 
which is very significant, and I want to tell you a little bit about that when we move on to our next subject and what, what that is hap here in, in, in locally. Um, I'm always left think, saying to myself, 12-year-olds on the track, didn't that kind of draw your attention before? It's like, you know, a lot of people had to be up in arms and, you know, a grant from the federal government to start looking at that. So there, there are problems there. I, I don't feel that the NYPD is doing a sufficient job at all to make this a priority. In fact, one of the things that we're doing at Now NYC is we, and one of the things that you could help with, so we're going to talk, this will be a little community involvement uh, as well, is we have a, a campaign called Ask a Cop. And it's our effort to survey cops on the street to find out what it is that they know about trafficking and about the laws that are on the books about trafficking here so that we can take that information to the police commissioner to just to say, hey, this information is not trickling down. And the cops, the entire force and the cops on the beat, on the street, need this information. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, and I can tell you what you can do if you want to do this yourself. Is, um, you know, I started this because I would see a cop on the street and I would just ask, you know, so this is the way it goes. Yes. So, oh, I was reading a story today about human trafficking. Is that happening here? And, you know, they'll talk to you because, especially, if they, they, often they don't have anything else to do. And that's, you know, better. They're, they're being asked directions all the time. This is at least a little, little different. Uh, and I had the first one I did, the, there were two of them. The one said, um, no, that's not happening here, very definitively. But in New Jersey, <laughs> you know, and it was just really, it was really uh, so funny. And, um, and all my conversations have gone like that. I have only spoken to one or two who, know, who knew about trafficking. And one of them was very well informed, and she was a woman cop. But she also was very quick to start talking about honor killings in Jordan and, and everything. So this is just clearly where her consciousness was. I sp uh, the last um, police officer that I spoke with, I told them, you know, so I heard about human trafficking. Is it happening here? He's like, oh, well, that's like, you know, that's like when you throw someone in the trunk and, you know, you put the Chinese on the containers. You know, that's, that's happening in, you know, other places and stuff. And I said, well, but I was reading in the story. And then, you know, then I just keep talking about this story that I've read. But I was reading in the story that there was a, a law passed here that increases the penalties for trafficking. And he, he started laughing at me a little. He said, no, no, no. The law you're talking about is for traffic agents. If you assault a traffic agent, you get a higher, it's, the penalties have gone up, which is true. That's fast. That's, that's but he couldn't even make the connection. And over and over, in the interviews that I've done, and we have a trafficking action network, we've been just out on the street, you know, just, um, they're unaware that there's a law now on human trafficking. They're unaware that the penalties for uh, soliciting prostitution have gone up, um, and they don't know how to describe it. Uh, if they, I mean, they wouldn't, they would not recognize, they would not recognize, if they did do a brothel raid, they wouldn't recognize the women who are there, who are, you know, there through trafficking. And um, there was some uh, federal training that was done that I found very, very interesting because there was a conversation. I saw one police officer say to the other one, he looked at his, his partner, he said, you remember that bus we did, da, 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 those three Mexican girls in the back? They were trafficked. And it, it dawned on him then, those three girls who were, who were scared, who didn't speak English, should have been, you know, uh, better served. Um, and one of the things that, that we're asking the local law enforcement to do is to have specially trained people, just like you have with rape crisis. Um, so if you do a, a, a brothel raid, you know, or, or on, you know, Saturday night in Midtown Court with all the prostitution arrests, is somebody there from the DA's office, it could be, um, who would be able to do just quick assessments, interviews, you know, whether it's top ten questions that you find out this person, if this is a potential trafficking situation. Because otherwise you're, you're not going to know. They're scared. Yes?
Sí. That would be part of the investigation. So let me, um, so let me then move on a little bit to, uh, you know, we, we, we started talking about the law enforcement and what's lacking there um, and all the areas in which um, different uh, social services could pl play a part in being able to identify victims, which would then lead to more investigations and more prosecutions. Because as it stands, New York has been a bit of a bonanza for traffickers. You just come here, you set up shot, and nobody really cares. Um, so I can talk about the internet, but let me talk a little bit more about another, another piece of community activism that we, that we have uh, created that you could also take part of. So in addition to Ask the, Ask the Cop, if you, go to, if you go to our website, you can get more information about that. Um, and it'll be, it's a very interesting exercise because you can just do it whenever you're sitting, you're in a subway. Or when you're, you know, you, you'll start to notice you see cops all the time, you just never really noticed it before. Um, but if you talk to them and you ha go through those series of questions, just when you walk away, just write down the location, the time, the date. The goal is not to get any one police officer um, um, in trouble for this. It's that the goal is to show the overall lack of awareness in the, in the police force. Um, and then you can send it to us and we're compiling this report. Um, so you can learn more of it on my website, which is nownyc.org. The other thing that we have done, and this goes to your question about internet um, and the marketing of these services, we started a campaign called uh, Trafficking Free NYC. Not long after we started working on this whole issue in terms of the legislation, you know, the questions start to, to arise. It's like, well, how do they come to town and just set up these businesses and nobody knows and we're just living our lives every day, going to Starbucks and going to work and going home and, and we don't even notice. Um, you know, how does it happen? So you have to then kind of open it up and take a look and ask the question, well, what are the, what are the legitimate businesses that are taking part in facilitating this? Who else is complicit in this? Now, we know some of the cops are, because we, 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 that's been documented. We see that. Case after case, you'll see that there's been some kind of police corruption, bribery going on with, with brothels and stuff. So the obvious thing was, you know, we see all of these sex ads. You know, we all know the Village Voice. You open up all those back pages. Um, but it's in all kinds of publications. It's in a lot of the ethnic, small neighborhood publications that are across Brooklyn and Queens, um, particularly in southern Manhattan. Um, it has been become their bread and butter of many of these sex ads. And a lot of that you can't distinguish. You know, when you've got the traffic industry that is a supplier to the existing sex industry, you can't really distinguish too much between which is the forced prostitution, which is the not, pro the not forced prostitution. And you can very quickly find out that you, can, you can't even distinguish some of it. Uh, we, our campaign um, is aimed at educating publishers about their role. Because they know, they know what they're doing. We pretend, we go there, we pretend that uh, we're educating them for the first time as if they don't know that these are a, ads, ads that are selling sex. Uh, but we make the connection with trafficking. Um, and we explain to them that they've got to do their due diligence. We ask them to sign a pledge that they are not, they're either going to do due diligence or, or we try to get them to just stop taking these ads because it's the, it's the marketing arm of this industry. And we've gotten about 17 or 18 publications to sign on, which is really great. Um, and, you know, we, the, the case that we make is like, you know, if you're going to be in the adult entertainment business by having a section on that, or the massage business, uh, you know, it's prone to abuse. It's not like selling furniture. Furniture is just furniture. Dental services are just dental services. But when you're operating in this area, it's prone to abuse, and it's incumbent on you to make sure that illegal businesses are not are not advertising in your publication. Uh, so we um, so we've been successful with that, and for a lot some for some of them, it's taken a long time. We convinced New York Magazine to stop their sex ads in the back, which I always found to be you know, very hypocritical because here was this beautiful glossy magazine and 
you know, you had fine dining, reviews, and opera on one page, and then you had hot Asian honeys on the back. Uh, it, it didn't make sense, and they didn't think that they should just get away with just doing that. I mean, one of those, and let me give you an example of trafficking, which took me about a year, a year to break them down, because they would come back every time with, this is a First Amendment right. Uh, then the next argument would be, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we are not the police. We can't, uh, we can't, you know, monitor all, all our ads. You know, if the police tell us something's wrong, we'll take it out. Not good enough. They had an ad, you know, uh, that said uh, it was for a resort in Dominican Republic. And it said, it read on the ad that appeared in New York Magazine, have your own harem. I just don't know how much, how much clearer can that be? What, they thought it was a joke. I mean, what, have your own harem. And all you had to do was go onto that website. You know, a click away was the information. The difference between a standard and a deluxe room was how much access you had to women. The standard room, you only got one. The deluxe room, you got two women. And they advertised Eastern and European women. So you had Eastern European women being trafficked to the Dominican Republic, to this resort that was then advertising in New York Magazine to American men here in New York City. Hmm, are there connections there? Yes. <laughs> I think they're all part of the same business. Uh, so um, with that, in terms of what you can do is I certainly can't be in every neighborhood throughout this whole area. If you pick up those free little publications um, and just take a look at what they have in the back of the magazine uh, in the newspaper. It's not something you would normally do because this is not a world that you've been operating in. And I, the thing is when you leave here, you're going to have a new perspective. You're going to see things differently and you're going to either curse me tomorrow or, <laughs> or, or be happy that you can do something, but you won't see it the same way. Um, but you know, I can, you know, if you just communicate with us, we can certainly evaluate those publications um, on our own if you want to do some of the investigation you're, uh, on your own. Because what we do is we go to a publication and when they try to tell us, oh, we don't know what this is, there's no way of knowing this, I, I just, you know, I pull the thing right off of the internet, which I've Googled. And you can Google somebody's phone number, if there's an ad for massage parlor, and whatever else is being advertised on, say, Craigslist will pop up. It's very easy. There's also websites. Uh, there's a website called spahunter.com, which is a play off of the website Spa Finder, which is about real spas, you know, like Oasis and Bliss. Spa Hunters, though, is about brothels, mas brothels slash massage parlors. I use those words interchangeably. Uh, and then rate the services, rate the women, um, and you can very, very clearly see what their real business is. And that's only a click away. And I don't think it's asking too much of, of, of publications to take that five minutes or less to check something out. And in the state of New York, you need a license to either perform and advertise a massage service. So the simplest thing to start with is a, is a, is a, is a, is a form that asks, asks the massage parlors to send in their information. What is their license numbers? It's not too much to ask. Yes, you have a question. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I will talk about that next. Um, should I finish up just in terms of the advertising? Let me, so if you in any way would like to help or be a part of that, you can certainly, uh, we have a trafficking action network that meets once a month. Even what I just described in terms of asking the cops on the street, um, you know, checking out publications, Googling them, seeing what, the, what those businesses really are for, and just very quick, you know when you take a look at it, something that it's not legit. Um, and you, you do it for a couple of days and you'll be an expert at it. There's certain words that are used in the ads. I mean, if you've got an entire page of just Asian faces with come hither looks, you know, it's, this is, you know, it's wink, wink, this is the brothel section. Um, and I remember one of, the, one of the ones that we pulled off of that Spa Hunters, one of the, the, the comments from one of the guys is he's telling the other guy, 
uh, he says, um, I asked, I asked, um, I asked Candy, I guess that, that was her name in the, in the brothel, if she likes doing this to men. And uh, he says, through much pantomime, um, she, she said, uh, first six months I cry. Well, anyone who has been work, you know, is crying every day because they're having to work in a brothel doesn't want to be there. You know, so that was, that was very valuable to show it to the, to the publisher and say, this is what you're taking part in. Now you have to decide who you want to be. And the thing to do after that, if they don't cooperate, is to go after their advertisers and tell their legitimate advertisers, which is what I started doing with New York Magazine. Started calling Macy's, which was advertised and spent a great deal of money with them. So there's always, you know, it's tenacity is a really important part of this business. <laughs> um, and you have to just keep plugging away at it that way. So, and the other thing, that I'd love for you to do when you get home is take a look at your yellow pages. Take a look at your Verizon yellow pages. Go to the escort service. You're gonna find that the escort service is one of the thickest in the entire book. Now my investigations show that, you know, it costs $45,000 to run a full page color ad in the yellow pages, the Verizon yellow pages. That's a lot of money. If you're in the prostitution business, you've gotta pay that up front. Unlike if you're a doctor's office, you can, do, you can pay that as part of your monthly phone bill, you know. So it's very interesting. They know exactly what they're doing. They want their cash up front for these businesses that move a lot. Um, and take a look at those. I, I wish I would have brought with me some copies because I'd want everyone to see it right now. But you'll have, there are ads in the yellow pages, the ones that we all have in our businesses and in our kitchen drawer. Um, pictures of and sketches and images of girls that look like they're eight years old and there's no there's no second guessing that they're made to look that old that that young little pigtails with a little pajama top um, and you'll be just flabbergasted and you know it's like who's to say they don't have 10 year olds that they that they market there the one of them that has a really young face, <coughs> you know, the business is called Asian Flowers. Is that, some, is that a coincidence? So I think about this and I think about, you know, I told you about Somali Men's book that I read just recently. And, you know, here she has, a, she's in a third world country. and I wonder how she feels coming here to the United States where she's trying to raise money for her shelters back in Cambodia to come here and go to a hotel and open the phone book and see pictures of eight-year-olds just in our, in our telephone book with the number to call, it, it, must, be, it must feel to her like there's, there's no winning. There's no winning this fight. The United States here and all of these, this democracy and all of these great people and this is okay with everybody? I think sometimes in the future, and I'm like, my goodness, if we do break this open and it becomes a really, a, an issue like domestic violence, if we get as far with it as we have with domestic violence, we'll look, someone will be speaking to an audience in 25 years saying, can you believe back, you know, back in 2000, you know, and, and eight, the yellow pages, New York City had pictures of little girls and uh, telephone numbers under their escort listings. You know, it's really, when you put it, when you think of it in those grand terms, it's, it's, um, it's very significant. So you wanted me to talk next a little bit about underage prostitution? Uh, that is happening here, too. And it's, it's startling. There's a couple of, um, this past year, what did pass was a, a law called the Safe Harbor for Exploited Youth Act um, that just passed by, the, by a hair. Um, the governor signed it in, into law. Um, what it aims to do, whether it will do it, I don't know. It is not as strong as the trafficking law of last year. It just got whittled down, whittled down a lot in the time that we were working on it. Um, but what, what currently happens is that that girls under 17 um, are, if you're arrested for prostitution, 
generally what happens is you, you're incarcerated through juvenile detention. So we criminalize them. And the juvenile detention centers are no place to get help. Uh, a lot of them lie about their age because that's what their pimps tell them to do. And they end up in Rikers where, you know, it's, as you can imagine, it's just not a, not a good situation. Um, so the, the, the law aims to, to defer you know, these girls from juvenile detention into special services. And I know that that sounds perfect, and I was, part of, I was a, a big part of, of making this bill happen, but to be frank, that um, isn't gonna happen. It's a lovely idea, and it would have been heartbreaking if our legislature did not agree that, at least on the idea, that this was something we needed to do. The problem is, is that that infrastructure doesn't exist. Those specialized services are not there for these, for these girls. And, you know, I don't know when it's going to be there. This, this is actually going to be the bigger, the bigger struggle moving forward with, with, with the underage prostitution is, um, is to get is to get the funds there for some services, to get them a specialized house and such so that they can, um, you know, start to rebuild their lives. So in terms of, you know, underage prostitution, one thing that I want everyone to think of, because, you know, it's like if you have a 20-year-old young woman who's working in prostitution, at some point she was underage, and we felt sympathy for her then, but the average age of entry into prostitution is actually 14 years old. The majority of women who are in prostitution don't decide at 20 years old, oh, let me go risk my life every night and have sex with all these anonymous men. That's going to be a lot of fun. It's, it's their life circumstances that have taken them there. Um, and here in New York City, there's been two studies. One was done by, um, by a government agency that said that there were at least uh, 2,250 underage girls working in prostitution in New York City alone. There was a, a, a research project done by John Jay College that just finished up that actually estimates it at 4,000, which is, seems more accurate because from what people have been seeing, they thought that that number was a little low, the, the first one. Um, you know what? I don't know. Actually, you know what? I will tell you. I've got an, 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 I've got an executive summary here, so maybe I may be able to tell you what it is. Um, and if I don't find it right this minute, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's startling. It is absolutely startling that this is happening. And the, you want to know the main way that they're being advertised? It goes back to your question, sir, which was it's on the Internet. It's on Craigslist. That's the way the, the, the pimps are working today. They recruit young women um, and young girls through neighborhoods from in front of schools. It's the classic story of treating them well, taking them out, uh, taking them to a nail salon, and then they're, they're in this. And then it becomes, it's like trafficking, and then it becomes a little bit more brutal. And they pit the girls against each other. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they beat them. They have quotas that they have to meet. They've got all across the city, they've got these little hot sheet motels, hotels, where you, you, know, you buy a room by the hour. Another area that we can go after, because they see these young girls coming in, they see the prostitution taking place, and they shouldn't be able to operate. They should be reporting it. Um, so it's definitely happening with the young girls. Um, we do have this new law in place that at least is the start of trying to work towards there. It's a recognition by our state government that this is an issue and that we don't, want to, we don't want to criminalize young girls, that they're first, they're victims. In the state of New York, you can't even consent to sex until you're 17. You can't even consent. You're not seen as old enough to really even consent to sex. But yet somehow a 14 or 15 or 16 or in many cases, a 12-year-old as well, when, when uh, money changes hands, they're a criminal and they're a, pros and they're a prostitute. 
especially when the money is going to somebody else. So there's a lot of work to be done in this area. That is the one area that the NYPD is, is focusing some of their efforts on. Um, and I think this would be a good time when I was talking to you a little bit about the culture that we live in and you know, how this is playing a role in it. it. was really, really interesting because the John Jay College study, when, when they interviewed a lot of these young girls, they really were able to, uh, they were able to identify 10% of these young girls who articulated what they saw is this is actually being a career path for them. They talked a lot about being porn stars. They, they talked about, they literally pointed to like the HBO shows like, um, you know, they've got the pseudo documentaries about prostitution. Um, that these, these girls were, the nice clothes that they had and how they got, they went to the nail salon all the time. And so what, what the researchers are saying is that you have you know, for these young girls to go into prostitution, they hit like a little a desperation point. They get um, targeted by a pimp, um, but that for some of them, they're going, they're actually going into it a little sooner than they would have before that desperation point or you know force point came in, because this industry has been glamorized. And then once they're in, it's a whole, it's a hard to get out of, really, really hard to get out of. They're very, very quickly, their sense of worth and their self, sense of self-esteem is shot. They're brutalized by, by their, their clients and Johns and their pimps. It's, you know, you're labeled at that point. So it's, um, it's very, very difficult. And, and one of the other things that we've been doing lately is we have this campaign against HBO. And we've protested in front of the headquarters on 6th Avenue a couple of times because here you have this network and they, they do some great work but then they also at the same time they do these pseudo uh, um, documentaries on are they mentioning any of these studies are they interviewing cops who, who are picking up 12 year olds so uh, that, and then they have this other show called Cat House, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with, which is, it's the, it's the uh, brothel, the legal brothel in, in Nevada. And it's, a, it's, a, it's supposed to be a documentary of this. And um, of course, all the girls are having a great time. They're so happy. But you know, if you talk to, I've been to producers who have who, who've been there for, for, for some of these shows that are, and they say it's the most depressing, decrepit place. Uh, you know, there's certain things, you know, the women, they come for two and three weeks. You don't get any of your money until, until you leave. If you decide to leave beforehand, you forfeit all your money. That doesn't seem like a good employment contract or what legal employment is supposed to be like. Uh, they've had assaults there. Um, you know, it was really, I mean, one of their shows, they had this, their, their, their pimp who's now such a famous guy He's giving out, you know, he's having like a sales meeting with the girls, and he's got a stack of VCRs. He's giving the, to them for the, you know, different things. He's got the, the hooker of the month who gets a check. And this hooker of the month, that it was 26 parties in four days, which is what they refer to it, you know, parties. So that meant she had at least 26 men or multiples of men or something in four days. That's, that, that resembles a lot like the low budget, you know, factory style uh, prostitution that, that we've been talking about that I described that takes place in these trafficking operations throughout the city. So it's, you know, if you have young women in your lives, you know, it's something to, to, to look at with a skeptical eye, a really skeptical eye. These, these shows and, you know, you know, if you find yourself, people are kind of, you know, like, oh, you're a prude or something. It's very, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing, and it's worth kind of doing some reading about to, to be able to arm yourself if you're interested. And there's another good book that's been out for a couple of years, but it's called Female Chauvinist Pig by Ariel Levy, L-E-V-Y. And she kind of documents in that kind of, ba you know, backlash way, kind of just documents, you know, the girls gone wild phenomenon. Um, and, and talks about HBO and, and kind of this self-objectification that seems to be taking place a bit in our culture and how the pornification of so much 
um, you know, is becoming really mainstream. And lo and behold, here in the results of this John Jay College survey, you actually find it being verbalized with young girls who are entering into prostitution um, a little sooner than they probably would have. And maybe that would have, there would have been a, a chance to save them or some other, other avenue that they could have taken. So is there anything else you would like to know about, um, about child prostitution? I do have a couple of facts and figures that are kind of interesting about from the first uh, government agency that, to, that took a survey. Um, of, the, of the over 50% of the NYC kids in prostitution, they already had prior juvenile justice placement. So they already been troubled in some way, shape, or form. And we didn't catch it then. So there's a parallel there. Just how we said we're not catching when when foreign women are arrested or when there's a brothel raid or you know, we're we're not all we're not also we're not evaluating situations for our American girls who are lured into prostitution because they have been involved, you know, with the the city and the state. So we're not catching it there what the problem is or that they're in prostitution. Uh, and very interesting, they did a survey of upstate kids in prostitution in upstate New York and in downstate. Um, in New York City, 44% of the prostitution took place in these hot sheet hotels or outside. So maybe on the, on the track or in a car or something like that. In upstate, 52% of it took place in people's homes. So people were dealing in children out of their homes. Um, and, and interestingly, um, the majority in New York City, it was with strangers. Upstate, it was with people that they, they knew, acquaintances. And 17% uh, of the kids in Upstate were used for uh, video pornography. So it's a different, it's a different makeup. Upstate, it's you know, it's a little, um, you know, and it's interesting because some of the legislators that we talked about really would love to say, we don't, we don't criminalize our kids up here. We don't do this. You know, you guys do in New York City. But the truth is, it's just more frank here in New York City. You've got, it's more of a business. You've got pimps who are putting girls on Craigslist and out on the street. It's a very clear transaction. What you have at other parts of the state would resemble more you know, sexual abuse and incest in the home. And somebody's making money off of it. Somebody's videotaping it and selling it. Someone's inviting their friends over and making money off of it. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting, you know, the different, the different forms that it's been taking in our state. And that agency, somebody asked about it, was the, is the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. OCFS, Office of Children and Family Services. OCFS is the one that did this, that did this study um, and that also um, works with some of these kids. So we've covered quite a bit so far. I'm just going to go over it because in case there's something that we've missed or more that you want to talk about. We've talked about, you know, the legislation in terms of trafficking at the federal and at the state level that have taken place. We've talked about a couple of the things that it's an international problem that's in our neighborhoods, from the way it's marketed in our newspapers to the brothels and massage parlors that are like Starbucks in our community. Um, we've talked a little bit about the, the culture that exists out there that has normalized and mainstreamed prostitution as some kind of wonderful career choice when the truth is, it's the number one way since the beginning of time that we have oppressed women. You know, if you, if you attack a woman's sexuality and you take it away from her, that's what you're doing. And the other thing we have to talk about is demand. Um, you know, it's, it's a real issue. If we didn't have the demand, it wouldn't exist. And 
everywhere we, we speak and everywhere when we read about this, we always, we always, the questions are, how did women get into it? You know, how do they survive it? Why do they do it? And those are actually, those are actually the easy questions to answer. They've been abused. They're addicted to drugs. They desperately need money. The harder question to answer is, why do men do this? What? Well, that's, 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 that's an easy way to find out about it. You know, your local newspaper, back section of your newspaper, back section of the yellow pages, uh, the so internet. Yeah, certainly there's the, tr there's the, the track in the South Bronx uh, from, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, by, by Chelsea Piers, there's apparently a spot for young gay youth that are runaways, and that's, that's where they land. Um, you know, it, it's, the industry has changed a lot. There's not so much street prostitution anymore. I mean, I think during our Giuliani years, you know, that was, that was really, um, cha that changed a lot. Um, and then with the advent of the, the internet, it's just so easy. You've got, um, you've got, it's, it, you can go on Craigslist where you can buy, you know, uh, look for a job and, um, and you know, buy uh, a stroller and, you know, also get erotic services, which is the listing there. Um, you have a question. Not, not a lot, and that, that's what's interesting, is we haven't put the spotlight on that, and it's just now... There is some that is being done now, which is really great, so this, that door has been opened. Um, you know, uh, and it, but it has to go through, I mean, it, it's like you have to, it's, it's very cultural, because you even you have the NYPD, which their arrest rates for prostituted women to men who've solicited them is four to one. In other cities, it is 20 to one. Um, so there has to be kind of a, 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 an evolution in, um, in thinking and the approach to this that, you know, in Sweden, you know, the, the model is actually that they've decriminalized it for the women. So the women, have gotten there somehow, and there's there's an element of being a victim there, um, and the men are the perpetrators, so they view it that way, and so it is illegal for the men, but the women, for the women, it's just been decriminalized. They're not they're not in, they're not you know going to get convictions over it. They try to put them into services, which we've talked a lot about uh, today. Um, and so that's that's one kind of model that is being used out there. Um, I think another thing is, you know, in, in other, you know, when, when I look, when I see the trafficking here, what you see is a, you see a pattern starting to take place in terms of the foreign women. You'll see that it's foreign traffickers from that country, it'll be Mexican traffickers who know the landscape in Mexico, who are finding and recruiting the Mexican women, bringing them here, and then they market to Mexican me men, the Mexican uh, immigrant population here. So in a lot of these countries, you know, if you read Somali Man's book, I mean, you just see it's so prevalent. Men just feel such a, such a, 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 an entitlement to just 
women's bodies, you know, just, just sex, and it's just like washing your hands, and it's, 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 it's a different mentality. It's different mentality. Um, not that American men don't, but it's, it's just even starker in other cultures where you see that women are, in general, just lower on the, um, you know, on the, on the social status uh, bar. So, uh, you, see, you know, that's part of it as well. Um, you know, and I, a lot of this, a lot of this mainstreaming that's happening happening now is keeping keeping that awareness from happening. I think an, an, another thing is, you know, the truth is that all of us know somebody, you know, probably in our family who is kind of sketchy. You know, it, you know, you don't want to think about it if it's the neighbor or it's. But the truth is, you know, we do. We're like, hmm. You know, I bet I wouldn't be surprised if that uncle here or there or something. But we don't, we don't talk about it. We don't, we don't confront it. We don't, we just ignore it. And they don't, there's no penalty from them, whether it's, you know, there's the legal penalty and then there's just the, the social stigma penalty. You know, we've done so much in terms of like smoking. Smoking, you know, you're a smoker and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really unpopular and you're stigmatized and you get looks and you just, you don't even want to admit it. It would be interesting if that could happen in the world of, of prostitution, you know, because a lot of problems would come to an end because there would not be the demand, therefore there would not be the, the you know, the entrepreneurs who are trying to make money to create, to find the supply for the demand. I, I, the points you are making are, are so, so very important. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, in the trafficking that we've seen, and it, that could be because maybe they're just focusing on women, we don't really see men traffic too much. The young, the young, the, young, the boys um, were, uh, were runaways. That's what they're seeing in that. But everything that you're saying is incredibly, incredibly valid. And it leads me to the conclusion, it's like, you know, just like women had a women's movement, Men need their own movement, you know, because they, you know, everything is spoken, you know, in, it's, you know, so much silence and your, you know, your, 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 your lives and what you're, you're supposed to, what is supposed to be success and what, what manhood is, is in a box and that all needs to be broken, broken open. Um, and I don't know if any of these can be changed until men start having those same kind of conversations uh, amongst themselves and create, you know, creating it in a, in a formalized way to get there. But, uh, but you're, in a, we, I, you're 
you, you could lead it. You're a nice, you're an enlightened man. It's great. I wanted to tell you a couple of the stats that did come or, from the um, from this uh, Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation, which finally did get some money to do a a survey about this, which is you know flipping this on its on its head. Let's take a look at the men. Um, and uh, so 79% had some college or graduate degrees. 62% had regular sex partners. So I thought that was very interesting. So maybe it was, had less, has less to do with that sex than, than, we, than we would think on the surface. 43% um, said if they paid a woman, they should get whatever sex act they wanted, which is, which is scary. Um, 57%, this is a high level of kind of awareness, 57% believe the majority of, of prostitutes had a history of sexual abuse. 42% said prostitution caused psychological and physical damage. So they knew what they were taking part in wasn't healthy. 80% said prostitution had a negative impact on communities. Then this is, this, this is so interesting. Then but 22% felt guilty. So you've got all these high percentages. I mean, we're in the 80s, 79, 60, 57, but 22, only 22% 22 felt guilty. It's really interesting. And here, where they asked the question, they dug into that why. A lot of men felt that men's sexual drives were out of control. So that's just kind of like an old myth. Men can't, their sexual drives are bigger than them, you know? They can't control themselves. Um, this is what men do. It's just, that's a, a definition of manhood. Um, prostitution helps control men's ravishing sex drives, as if, you know, that's somehow, if they didn't, they would lead them to rape or something. I, that's, that's hard to believe. You know, and it, you know, it just comes down to, if we don't stem the tide of demand for, particularly young girls' bodies, it's getting younger and younger. You've got 12-year-olds out there. Um, the demand will, be, will continue to be met by coercion and violence and force and exploitation of vulnerable women, girls, and men. So what did they say would be a deterrent? 87% said public exposure would be a, a deterrent for them. So that wouldn't be so hard to do. 83% um, said jail time, which doesn't happen. Uh, and 79% said a letter to their family. So that shame factor could be really significant. We do have like it, the, the Brooklyn DA's office, which I think is a very progressive um, uh, office in, term of, in terms of criminal justice and sexual violence issues concerning women. Uh, they have a John School, which is the only one in the five boroughs. So what they aim to do is, um, you know, it's almost like what we talked about with the young girls, instead of deferring for juvenile uh, delinquency, if they, if they will take services, if we could have them get services, that would be a better remedy. Um, and the same thing with men who are arrested for prostitution at the John School, that they could avoid a conviction if they do this, you know, it's like a, a seminar, which is whatever it is, whether it's a day or two. Um, the, um, it's pretty good. I think that they focus a lot on the health aspect, so it comes back to, to the individual. You know, you know, you're going to catch diseases, you're going to do this. And it could be a little bit more about just the overall, how this, you know, how this affects the women involved. And, um, you know, maybe a warning there, and then if we catch you again, <laughs> we'll be publishing your name or something. Um, but, uh, but that's one effort locally to deal with demand and hopefully we'll have more in the future. So uh, there's a few more questions. Um, Lawrence? Yes. Um, you know, I've heard several different things in my lifetime. In the last few years, it's been the whole four-hour thing about human trafficking and Christopher Lane. In the last few years, it was one called, Why Am I Joy? And he did, with his music, and it's around the system of abuse. Uh, but I, I, we never got to learn, I never got to learn in the two hour segment if it was maybe that another prostitute was selling. Because if you acknowledge, the women are pitted against each other. Um, what I often bring up when I come to any of these sex uh, sessions, when, when you're speaking, I always talk about the impact of people with disabilities because somebody does have cognitive and developmental 
you know, I'm not sure. I really haven't delved too much in, in that area of the violence of women against women. I do know that that is a kind of a, a tactic. You know, in the industry, you see it in Cat, cat House to the, the, the pimps who have young girls working from them, the way that they pit women against each other. Uh, it really so much mirrors, you know, just what was done in, in the South with slavery, you know, pitting, you know, slaves who got to work inside and ones who got to work outside. Um, I wanted, I did want to mention, um, uh, on a good note, the first case for, under the trafficking um, law that was passed in 2000, has been, um, has gone through the court system. And interestingly enough, it's about a child prostitution case. There's this guy named Cody Wooten, who actually recruited a girl as she's walking home from school, walking home from school here in Brooklyn. I don't know what school it was. She was 16, and he took her to have her nails done, took her out to eat, tr treated her well, and, um, and then within a short period of time, once he'd gotten her, her, um, her trust sum, he invited her to the Bronx. So he takes her to the Bronx. So she's away from Brooklyn. You know, she's in the Bronx. He locks her up in her apartment puts an ad out for her on Craigslist. Guys start showing up. She's there for two weeks and she has 200 customers. She was 16 years old. She, uh, she escaped. She escaped and, you know, that's, that's how her parents were looking for her. Um, and um, so that was the first, the first, first case on the trafficking law that was prosecuted. Uh, he had a, um, I mean, he had like a, a $12,000 watch on when they arrested him. Just, so um, he's gonna go to jail for, a, he has, the sentencing hasn't happened yet, but he'll, gonna, he'll go to jail for, for a long time. So this was a, a victory for this law and as well for the, the, uh, the, you know, the DA's offices that were involved in making that happen. Another thing that we're talking to the DA's offices is to set up investigation units. Why not? We've got the law. We've seen from the federal cases that have taken place here in just the New York metro area that it happens on a grand scale as well as a small scale. Like he just, this was one girl at a time for him. But he made a lot of money. Um, and, you know, we do investigations and have units for all kinds of just, you know, all the money, and you read constantly the stories about the, uh, the, the, um, you know, the uh, fake bags. Uh, what do you call that? Pirated, you know, brands and stuff. We put so much time and money into that. If we can do that, isn't, isn't you aren't human beings worth the same? You know, I remember there was I was reading uh, an article about uh, a um, construction site. Uh, what do you call them? Shakedowns which are kind of low-level organized crime, you know, and you go and you say, uh, this, this person, uh, you know, you have to hire this guy. If not, you know, they'll, they'll disrupt your construction site. This is very normal, you know. That, I mean, it was like a million-dollar investigation to crack open the, the, this little gang that was doing these construction site gate uh, shakedowns. Shouldn't we put this, that kind of money into following some trafficking operation? All you got to do is go to the Yellow Pages or, you know, the back of no longer New York Magazine, but other magazines and, and get your leads. So I think there's a lot to be done, and I, I hope that you, um, that you take this information and that you're able to continue to talk about it when you go to cocktail parties with your friends, because we have to just spread the word. Knowledge is power. And um, I hope that you can help us with our campaigns, with Ask the Cop, the traffic, trafficking free NYC with the publications. I mean, the more the more pressure we put on everybody, and the more we make this an issue, it'll continue to evolve. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's a it's a, it's a it's a it's it's an insidious problem. But I look to what all that's taken place in the domestic violence movement. Thirty years ago, there was not there was not a name for domestic violence. We didn't name it. Um, we didn't have laws against it. It was, there was no awareness on the, the, on, on the, in law enforcement. 
they, they went to a, a dispute at a home. That was a private matter between a man and a woman. Uh, we've come a long way, right? We've named it. We have services for the victims. We have, we, we've really drilled down and we know these are the top 10 things that would, you know, we could say to victims that this would mean that you are being abused. We've had an evolution of laws. We had a law that was passed um, last year or the year before, which was orders of protection for pets. You know, because pets are, are hurt and injured in domestic violence situations, because it's, you know, that's the way you hurt somebody else. Um, so that's what we have to do with, with human trafficking, because it is happening on a, on a large scale. We know it, and we've started that process. Often that st starts with the legal, the legal changes, and then a lot of the cultural changes we've talked about that need to take place, and, and speaking to men, and, and, um, and speaking to the businesses who are profiting from this. So I want to thank you so much. very much, Sonia, and thank you for everybody uh, for joining us here today. Um, thank you for your work and for telling us about it. Uh, we are going to be continuing. I was thinking, actually, the oldest profession in the world, I would say, coming pretty close to it is probably war. So I guess we have a couple of things that we have to work on that are testosterone-driven. Uh, on December 13th, Gloria Steinem is going to be coming in and is moderating a panel which will be in the auditorium. It will be part of the center's uh, panel discussions, but it will be in the auditorium. She's entitled the panel Sex Trafficking and the New Abolitionists, 